Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I am super excited to have you on the show because as I'm going through the research on your life, it just seems that you're one of these guys that doesn't take no and you get punched and punched and punched and you're like, yeah, 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 that's fine. And you just keep going. So I have so much that I want to dig into. So I think what we'll do is we'll go through sort of your story so people understand what I'm talking about. And then I want to take a little little look under the hood and figure out how you're wired so that we can help people who are, you know, when they get some setbacks um, in the fetal position in the corner crying. Fair that enough. Sounds, maybe, that sounds great. Maybe it'll be also a therapy session for me and I can <laughs> learn more about myself. Well, I'm going to take you back to McLean, Virginia. Do you remember that place? I do. I do. So back in the 80s, um, so you made a decision and you said, hey, look, I, I'm going to I'm going to sell T-shirts. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make T-shirts. I'm going to sell T-shirts. When you look back on that, you know, 1980s version of you selling the T-shirts, where did that entrepreneurial drive come from? In other words, did you did you come from a family that didn't have a lot of dough and you just wanted to make it or were you just wired that way? You know, I, I've struggled to answer this question a few times because I asked my parents, I said, gosh, what, tell me about my childhood. Why? What was I doing that made this happen? But it might just be one of those osmosis things. You know, my parents both worked at home because they work for themselves. And I always saw them doing things that weren't entrepreneurial in the sense that they were starting companies and raising money and all these things that in Silicon Valley, I now kind of associate with entrepreneurship, but they were at home. They were working from home. They were starting their, they were working their own business. Um, you know, my dad was speaking at an event. My mom was planning conferences. So I was really exposed to that kind of entrepreneurial spirit my whole childhood. Um, but I don't know if there was a moment where it just clicked and it was like, that's what I want to do. I think I didn't even know what I want to do when I went to college. I just thought business. I want to do business. Business guy. What did your dad do? You said speaking. What did he do exactly? So he uh, has been in the telecom industry forever. So working at large carriers, uh, my mom and him ran a long distance company back when that was a thing. Um, when I was a kid, uh, then he went on to work at a VoIP uh, company. And so his whole career was in telecom. Right, so you've got some tech in your DNA, for sure. You got some tech for in sure. your DNA. I, I remember when, this is, this is a, a nerdy reference, but when Windows 3.11 for work groups came out, you could network computers in the house. And so what we, we had one printer and the three computers in the house running over like thick coax cable could print to the one computer. And it was like, whoa, that was cool. Um, and, you know, I was on Prodigy, turned AOL, turned BBSs. I was definitely a computer nerd. Uh, I took my dad's laptop once to school in sixth grade. And, you know, I was not the cool kid. Let's just like make it real clear. <laughs> Yeah, but listen, as we get to the end of your story here, we're going to we're going to find out how cool you actually wound up becoming. So, you know, let's uh, let's dig in a little bit later and let's move into the, you know, let, let's call it Chris uh, 1.0. You moved into the sort of like investing investment banker uh, years and, you know, you didn't love that either. <laughs> you know, you're like this isn't for me. And then you went, OK. I'm going to consult. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to consult. And you went, yeah, I don't like that either. And so you just kept doing these things that you didn't like. Why do you think looking back now with uh, your much more mature eyes, why do you think you were making these decisions over and over again that just weren't working? I, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do. And I could look back and I remember there were a couple of times in college where I like wrote a business plan for a class and entrepreneurship is tricky, right? It's, you know, it's risky and you have to know what you want. And I'd not been exposed to any form of like Silicon Valley entrepreneurship. I remember the moment that I was exposed to kind of startup life as we know it now, it was like a light bulb clicked and I was like, oh my gosh, the last X years of my life were all for nothing because now I get it. But until then, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so the investment banking job was purely a factor of, I have no clue what I want to do when I graduate. And all my friends told me that investment banking was a great job. 
So if I don't know what to do, I might as well do what everyone says is great. And as much as any one of my teachers would have told you, I was the kind of person that would never listen to anyone, including the teacher. For some reason, I just was drawn towards this thing that I, I wasn't particularly excited about, but I had no alternative. And I would say the first 10 years of my professional career could be summed up with, and probably the reason I'm so into personal finance is I never really found something that I felt like I could do for a decade. And so I was kind of had this deep rooted fear that I had no way to make money that I enjoyed. And so life was all about optimizing money because I, I didn't love what I was doing. And I kept trying. Th- it's not like I didn't try. I tried like, you know, I, I joke with my wife. She worked at one company for 10 years. And in that same time, I think I had eight jobs. Um, right. Well, you know, so then then after that, you decide you want to you, you go to this startup weekend thing. And now we're starting to like the lights are starting to come on. You go into this place and you're like this. There's something here. I, I, like I can't put my finger on it, but there's something here. What was it about that startup weekend where you're like, I, I think I'm good at this? I'm not sure if I knew I was good at it, but I knew it was what I wanted to do. And I basically realized in a moment that people could build products on the internet as a job. And I don't know why I didn't know that existed, right? I used products on the internet. Um, but for me, it was never a career option. It, you know, my school didn't have that as like, hey, here's something you should go talk to companies that build products on the internet. But I'd used products on the internet since I was so young. And I felt like I knew them better than almost anyone else because I was so deep in it. And I was like, gosh, the thing that I love doing, I could actually work on the products that I enjoy where do they do this? And everyone's like, oh, they, they do it in San Francisco. I was like, I have to go there. Like, this is where I have to be. And, you know, I moved almost, you know, within the year and that kind of changed my trajectory completely. All right. So now, now you decide, okay, this is, this is my thing. I'm going to do this. And somewhere around 2008, you, you were working and you wound up getting called into this guy's office. You don't even like, you're like, I don't even know who the hell this guy is that's working at this company. And he decides, you know, you're done and you're out of here. We're going to fire you. But you still didn't get deterred. In fact, not only did you not get deterred, you went, let's make laid off <laughs> let's make we're gonna make so it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing i always feel like there's a trump in there so i feel like i'm gonna do, about to do a trump impression it's gonna be terrific <laughs> you know we're gonna we're gonna have all the laid off people <laughs> like you've never seen like where did that come from it's funny if you've made that reference in 2008 i might have appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all did we all had the book remember the book i right? remember well, the book i had a board I mean, game of the board game, the I, I mean, I think I wore the red tie. Oh, man. Yeah, so uh, 2000, 2008, I got laid off. And I was kind of sitting in San Francisco. I'd kind of met a bunch of people in the tech industry. I'd seen this kind of style of conference where people, it's called bar camp. People just kind of creative, you know, the agenda on the fly. Then I get laid off and I'm like, well, it's November 2008. Like, I'm not gonna find a job. Who's going to hire someone in the wake of the financial crisis with, you know, two major holidays in the next six weeks and everyone else is getting laid off. And I don't really know anyone in this town because I moved here one month ago. Uh, what if I just do some event and, and maybe 10 people show up, maybe 20 people, who knows, but at least I could say, let's get all these laid off people together and see what happens. And, you know, it just kind of like snowballed into, you know, a, a moment in the zeitgeist of America of all that was going on. And we ended up doing 20 events around the country. The, the first laid off camp had every major press outlet from the Wall Street Journal to the NP- NPR all showed up and wrote, wrote pieces on it. And it was this amazing opportunity to kind of network, build brand, meet people, you know, relationships, all that good stuff. And, you know, I didn't make any money. It was not a business. Uh, you know, I got some free pizza that I, you know, a sponsor paid for, but that was kind of it. But it did kind of jumpstart a lot of relationships uh, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley with companies, with startups. I ended up working with a few of the sponsors at the event. Some of the people I met there, you know, I still know today. And so, you know, I didn't really have a choice, right? I had time. My wife was like, you can't just sit at home all day and do nothing. Uh, but I couldn't get a job. So, you know, what, what else options do I, what other options do I have? How long do you give yourself to grieve a loss, business loss? How long do you give yourself 
where you're like, you're getting fired and this isn't working out. You know, are you one of these guys that, you know, has a pity party for a day and then, you know, you go like, fuck this. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not going to live here and you have to talk yourself out of it. Or is it natural for you to just go onward and upward? No, I mean, it's funny. I, a lot of entrepreneurs, I, I started a company uh, maybe four or five years ago. It was an online financial planning firm. And, you know, before we ran out of money, I was like, this didn't work. Let's move on. So I would say I'm not the kind of person that like holds on to any kind of business, anything until the last moment and, and kind of gets upset. I'm like, hey, it didn't work. Sorry. Like, you know, that's how business works. Like most businesses don't work. It doesn't bother you. You don't, you don't take it personally. You don't, um, you know, lick your wounds. You just, you know, this, and the reason why I'm pressing this point is there are many people who are in situations where they, they gave up. And they were the late great never was. And it's it's that moment, you know, and 20 years ago, I tried this thing and it, business wasn't for me, you know, and they just and, and they just they they are soured by it. And then there's other people like you that are just lions and you just keep going. So I'm trying to, like, figure out where that is. It like nature, nurture. Do you force yourself? Does it just like where does that come from? Where does it come from? I, I feel like I'm I'm a very. I have a very logical process for thinking through things. And I'm like, okay, most businesses fail. Customer acquisition cost was really high. This didn't work. We didn't crack the nut. Let's move on. Like, move and on. I think to my detriment, uh, you know, it's really, if you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the face of everyone saying this isn't working, they found a way to make it work. So I, I probably had some reflective moments thinking, gosh, am I ever going to be the person who builds, you know, a hundred billion dollar kind of Facebook, Amazon, you know, probably not because I, I, you know, in the face of this isn't working, I, I can, I, I struggle to suspend belief and just kind of push through anything. And I think I could do that a bit, but not nearly as much as I think is necessary to, you know, build a multi-billion dollar company where you just basically have to believe in this future so strongly that even when the whole world says no, you say yes. And I feel like I'm pretty good at fighting for what I think is is kind of going to be real. And when I'm building products at a company, I'm like, this is the future. We should build this. And if everyone says no, I still push. Um, but when the data kind of says, no, it's not working, I have no you know, problem being like, it didn't work. Let's move on. Let's try something new. And I think right. I could probably benefit from sticking with it a little more. Um, but you know, in the professional world, it's just, it's so easy. And maybe this is spending so long in venture capital, seeing the numbers. It's just so easy to be like, it's not always supposed to work. So let's not waste time if it's not working, because I think speed, speed and, and iteration and testing is like one of the most valuable things we can do in, in our lives and in our work. And, you know, I'm not afraid to say it didn't work. Let's try something new. Uh, maybe too fast though. Have you um slight side side note here? Have you listened to the podcast The Dropout on Theranos? I have not. With uh the lady who was trying to like make a, a, a oh no, no, I'm very familiar with the Theranos story. We have a we have a mini Theranos uh ornament on our Christmas tree that I gave my wife this year. So uh very familiar with the story, but not what are the you, podcast. What do you first of all, if you know the story, you must listen to the podcast. I was listening to Joe Rogan the other day and he's obsessed with it. And I love him as everybody does. Um, and so I started listening to it. It'll suck as a podcaster, you will be sucked right into it. It's so freaking good. Uh, but you gotta you gotta tell me about the the ornament. What is what's the significance of the ornament? Well, there's this company, uh, Mischief, that does these crazy weird boxes. They're like secret surprise stuff. And they made these products called Dead Startup Toys, where they took like a handful of startups, like one laptop per child, um, Theranos, uh, Juicero, these products that like were mass consumer products that totally flopped. And then they shipped out the little mini versions of them. And I knew my wife loved the Theranos story, the Juicero story. And every year we get each other ornaments as like part of our kind of holiday tradition. So I bought one of these mini Theranoses. I drilled a little hole, added a little thing on the top so you could hang it on a tree. And sitting on our, our tree is a, a little mini Theranos with a little drawer that slides out. Oh my God, that's freaking awesome. Um, okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about your travel. I'm a travel guy as well. Actually, I'm sitting here in Florence, Italy right now recording this. 
um, and your uh, your company um, at that at the time you did your trip around the world, uh, you recognized I could be virtual and I can do this anywhere, which is probably sort of around the time that you know. I, I don't know, maybe we all read, you know, our, our Lord and Savior's book, Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, right? And we all started going, well, we could do that. Um, looking back on that experience now, how do you view that year off through your more adult eyes, looking back on it, if, that, if the question makes sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be clear, when I took that trip, I was, you know, I realized you could exist virtually, but I was certainly not working. So that was a let's backpack on such a low budget, no income coming in, st stay in $1 a night hotels. But what I, when I look back, I, I reflected on this recently and I was actually quite surprised. I think the thing I learned from travel that I didn't even realize I learned was that everyone in the world does things in different ways. And you saw people living lives that were wildly different and actually probably happier than most of the people I know in the States. You saw people working in different ways, uh, commuting in different ways. There's just a million different ways you could do almost anything that results in uh, an optimal outcome uh, for a certain group of people. So what that led me to believe, and, and I definitely didn't realize this at the time, was that there's a lot of different ways to do things. And some way that might not be familiar to you might actually be better. Um, so I like the way that people eat in uh, Southeast Asia. Like that's the food I like eating. We cook uh, Thai food, Malaysian food all the time. And so it kind of led me to this path of optimization, which is it's not just the, the small number of kind of options that I know now. There's a world of options and, and there's probably a world beyond that that I'm not even aware of. So let's try to find the most optimal everything, right? The most optimal hoodie might not even be something you can buy in America. So where is it? What is it? I want to try it on. Uh, you know, I met a guy the other day who's literally on the quest for the perfect hoodie. And we were like debating, you know, which country might it come from? Probably Japan from a quality of uh, product standpoint. But um, so, yeah, it led me to believe that there are probably optimal ways to do things that you might not be thinking about. And it really fueled my kind of optimization brain, which is kind of now, you know, my personality really is, is trying to find the best ways to upgrade your life or travel, everything. That's like the spirit of, of what I try to do every day. How does, what's, what's the wrong side of that optimization look like? In other words, does, does your wife look at you and go like, Hey dude, don't optimize me. Do you know what I mean? Like, let me be me. Stop trying to tweak me. Does that, does that ever, appear in any other way negatively it definitely does it, fortunately i i kind of i don't know if it i don't remember whether i tried but i do not try to optimize my wife but <laughs> there have been moments where i think i've tried to optimize things that she wasn't interested in optimizing and funny enough she's kind of now moved towards me to the point that we both see the kind of challenges of, you know, why are we spending 40 minutes to try to do something to save $2? So the optimization, the hardest thing about optimizing is that it's impossible to step back. So, you know, I, Ramit Sethi is a, a good friend of mine and we were talking and he said, you know, you have to realize that as you, you know, build your wealth and build your skills and build your career, the things you can optimize, you have to spend the time on the higher order ones. And they might not have been able to, you might not have had the option of doing that earlier, but now you do. And so quits trying to optimize for your grocery cart, right? You know, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I'm buying something online, I'll pull up two things, put them side by side. You know, is it cheaper to buy it from Instacart or Whole Foods or Amazon? Like which, who has the cheapest tortillas? And I've had to let go of that desire to save, you know, a dollar here, $2 there, because frankly, now that I run a business, like, there's just a better use of time and spending that time optimizing a business probably has a much bigger outcome on my financial and professional future than saving a dollar uh, by playing around in my shopping cart for groceries. But I will say, you know, everyone that doesn't understand it, they're like, you're insane. Why would you do that? What they don't know 
is that there's more than a dollar saved is the value, right? The satisfaction of checking out with a grocery cart that is the lowest price you could possibly get, like that is worth more than just the dollar savings. It's probably not worth enough to do, but like I get such deep satisfaction out of knowing that I like found the optimal something. Even if it's like, you know, looking down the street, the stoplights are all changing in different ways. And I knew to turn at the right moment. So I didn't sit at a red light and I get home and I'm like, I feel good. That was great. That was a good drive home. Is your wife wired the same way? Um, I think she's wired similarly, but more nurture than nature. Uh, you know, we, we have a 15 month old and, you know, when you start to introduce solid foods to a baby, there's all kinds of choking hazards, food hazards, all this stuff. And so we were trying to come up with meals. And I remember my wife sitting there on the computer for like an hour, hour and a half, trying to researching what's the meal plan for this week? What are we going to make her tonight? And then she told me, she's like, gosh, I, there's this company and they just have a hundred day meal plan. It's like $50. They've done all the research. And I was like, why don't we just buy it? And she was like, oh, but it's $50. I can find all this information online. And I'm like, I know, but you spent an hour and a half and we've just got through today. <laughs> There's 199 more days. And so I think we're now at a point where we each push ourselves to not be that kind of like version of ourselves that is, is wasting time. But I don't know, we, we've been together for almost 17 years now, 18 years now. Early days, I think she would have thought I was crazy. Um, so, and- okay. So do you know, uh, have you heard of the author, David Bach? Do you know that name? Yes. He financed maybe well, yeah. New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Yeah, he, yeah he's, he's written, uh, he's been in the New York Times for the last 20 years. He's written all these books like, uh, um, he's mostly targeting the 20 year olds who are in a bunch of debt and, you know, teaches them how to you know, much like Ramit, I'm sure, how to get wealthy, et cetera. Yep. And he recently moved here. Our kids are in the, uh, the same school here in Florence, the International School of Florence. And he recently moved here. And, and he moved here because he said, you know, for all these years, I've been teaching people how to get wealthy and how to get rich, that I finally decided that I want to live rich. And for him, living rich was moving into, you know, a city like Florence. And when I think about this conversation of optimizing, it's an interesting one for me because the lens in which you use, the lens in which you consider things to be optimized could be a moving target. For example, most of my friends who live here now, um, they go get custom shirts and custom suits and they're not cheap. I mean, even, you know, even if you go to, a, you know, a, a, you know, not a well-known place, it, you know, it could be $2,000 for the jacket. And that's like a base kind of thing. So you can go, you know, and find a perfectly fine jacket uh, at any place here in Florence. But there's something about the quality of the hand-picked thing and, you know, choosing where you want the buttons, how it fits you perfectly, how you choose the material and blah, blah, blah. So one could argue that the optimization of getting a suit is the bespokeness of the product, but you're going to pay for it. And somebody else could say, it's just a jacket. Are there things in your life that you overpay for because the quality is there and you don't care because that is the optimization? Or are you the guy that say, I would never do that. I'm always going to look for the deal no matter what. No, yeah. There- I, I always tell people that I want to live that like a life that's upgraded life, but I don't want to pay if I don't have to, but like, look, I have a brand new iPhone. Uh, did I try to find like the best deal to get a trade in so that I paid the lowest price for sure. But was I ever considering like, you know, a knockoff, you know, Android phone? No, like I really appreciate the quality of work that Apple puts out. I have a new Mac mini that I purchased this week. Um, did I wait till black Friday to get my gift card when I bought it? Yeah. But like, I wasn't buying, uh, you know, an Acer computer, uh, to try to save some money. Um, you know, when we had a child, I wanted a camera to take photos that were better than a phone. And I bought, you know, a nice, uh, you know, Sony camera that was over a thousand dollars. Uh, so for me, it's yeah. But did I buy it on Amazon, uh, in one of those like warehouse deals where it was like, like new, but you know, $200 off for sure. 
So I, I'm totally willing to have, I want nice things. I appreciate nice things, right? Uh, you know, I use a Peloton. I don't, you know, I tried the DIY version once where you buy like the hundred dollars spin bike and you mount the iPad and these Bluetooth sensors. And then finally went, went for the real thing. So, uh, you know, we drive a Tesla model three. It's not the cheapest car, but you know, I really enjoy the quality and there was no hacks. There were no deals. Like there was nothing I could do to get a better price there. Um, so I just paid for it. Um, now did I shop around for a low interest rate so that we like, I, I, you know, yeah, of course I wasn't, I didn't go with their financing, but you know, that that's kind of my mantra is I don't want to find the cheapest, like 10 year old used car. There's a lot of people in the financial independence movement where it's like, go for the lowest price thing, drive your 13 year old car, heck sell your car and just ride a bicycle 13 miles to the grocery store, like build a rake out of sticks in your backyard. Like that's not me. Like I want to have nice food. I want to go out to nice restaurants. I've, paid for my fair share of Michelin restaurants, uh, Michelin starred restaurants. There's no discounts there, right? Like, did I use the right credit card to get the most points? Sure. But like, I'm not not going. All right. So you had some exits, right? You created an app called Milk and uh, Google acquired it. And then you created uh, an app called Grove and um, that was acquired by Wealthfront, right? So in no way... Are you hurting for cash? You got money, right? There's no somebody. So when Google buys a product, it, I'm, I'm sure it's it's uh, it's it's probably a nice payday. Is there a number for you where you would no longer look at the points? You'd no longer be, you know, trying to do the DIY Peloton where you're like, fuck it, I don't like. I'm just I'm gonna buy whatever I want. My life's half over. You know, I'm just going to do it or is or is the game for you in this and it doesn't matter how much money you have. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I think about I think international business class travel is this great example where I can't imagine amount of money that I would have where I would buy a flight for seven thousand dollars. Like it just doesn't compute. You can't do it. like I, I can't imagine doing it. Uh, but I also, to be honest, I could not imagine at this point in my life flying to Europe in coach. Like, I, I don't mean that in an elitist way. Like, I'm not going to pay for it. Like, to be clear, like I both I know, can't, I get it. I can't imagine flying in coach, but I also would never pay for business. So, you know, I guess if, if the whole points world imploded, all airlines got rid of points and the only option was to pay, I'd be in a real pickle, but, uh, I can't, you know, I think it'll always be a, a part of my personality. It'll probably creep up. You know, I never, I don't think I'd ever paid for a hotel room over $200 until the last few years, but you know, I've never, never paid for a hotel room. It's a thousand dollars. Like, um, you know, my wife and I were in the Bay Area and we were looking at Napa and we were like, I wonder if we should take just a weekend before the end of the year. And all these nice hotels in Napa, they're like $1,400, $1,500, $1,600, $1,700 a night. It's blowing my mind. And I don't know if I've just been so out of touch by using points, but like who's paying $1,500 a night for a hotel? I don't know who these people are, but they're they're not me. Uh, and it's it's kind of making me nervous about the future, but you know, that's why I keep racking up the points. Um, so yeah, well, I don't know. And, and to, be right. fair, to be fair, to go back, um, I think there's this like thing that you have to look at in Silicon Valley, which is like, what is an acquisition? And I, I'm guilty and, and feel somewhat disingenuous for using the nomenclature of acquisition, uh, you know, at Wealthfront during this, this acquisition. Like I didn't make any money, right? Like I got a job. Some of the people on the team got a job. They took over the office lease. Like there were a lot of things that went into that kind of deal, but like I didn't make any money. Now, to be clear, I have been very fortunate. There have been other things that were acquisitions, but you know, uh, I, I'm in a point where I certainly don't have enough money to not think about anything, at least while living in the Bay area. If I were to go move <laughs> to, you know, Thailand, maybe I would be set and not have to worry about anything for the rest of my life. Um, what is all the hacks and why did you start it? Yeah. So, you know, in some ways it was my COVID project, but um, in other ways, it was like the culmination of my being. Um, I've always been this person that wants to optimize everything and, and upgrade life. We've, we've talked about it a lot. And so every time I'm at a dinner, it, it's, it becomes the place where I share 
you know, all these things I'm learning, whether it's, you know, flying around the world for free or finding ways to get a raise at your next job or, you know, optimizing your day or your email inbox or keyboard shortcuts or software that makes everything efficient. And I think what happened was over COVID, <clears throat> I wasn't going to as many of these dinner parties. And so I had friends reach out and they're like, Hey, we haven't, we haven't caught up. Like what's the latest, what are the tricks? I'm, I miss them. And I was like, Oh, maybe I should write an email. Maybe I should write a blog post. And, you know, I just thought about where a lot of the ideas come from and they come from meeting people and then meeting other people and sharing what I learned. I was like, well, podcasts are really good format to do that. And simultaneously, uh, a good friend of mine had me on his podcast. He was like, you always say you're going to start a podcast. Are you going to do it? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. He's like, perfect. I am just going to ask you the question. Tell me about this new podcast. And then you have five days to record the answer and send it to me. And so um, this is Kevin Rose. He, he runs a podcast called Modern Finance. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went home and I was like, what's the name of this podcast? What's it about? What's the tagline? I need to record a trailer. And I remember like scrambling. And I didn't realize that Apple has like a multi-day waiting process to approve a podcast. So I like send him the audio file and I'm like, can you hold off? Don't publish it yet. Don't publish it yet. And then Apple, like right at the time where he's like, I can't wait any longer. Apple approved it. The trailer was up. And I was like, now I have a podcast. I was like, yeah. I was like, when I have to go like make a podcast, like all I'd done was recorded a trailer for one minute on a microphone. Um, and, si and I went into it thinking, look, I could just do a season, six, seven, eight episodes, you know, call it a day. And then I just loved it. And I spend every week, I find, you know, someone who knows more than I do about some area in life, whether it's buying a car, you know, traveling, optimizing your credit cards, you know, everything. I talked to Manu Ginobili, a, you know, Argentinian basketball player who, who played in the NBA for 16 years, like, you know, in his forties, I'm not even 40, like, and I could never play even like an intramural sport as well as, you know, most people. And he's doing on the main stage. So it's really a, you know, a place to explore ways to upgrade and optimize life and money and travel and career and productivity and your relationships with your loved ones and your kids and all of that in, in an environment where you're spending less and saving more. So yes, if, if you have to pay to pay, yeah, I'm going to learn how to do that. But there are oftentimes ways that you can learn to optimize in kind of they're little hacks to figure out how to do it for less cost. And I want to it's find a, them all. And it's so, a great, you know, great name. That's the quest. It's me, my quest to find all the hacks. How did you uh, find yourself on Tim Ferriss's podcast? So I met Tim maybe 10 years ago through the startup ecosystem. And, you know, we got to talking and Tim and I share a mutual love for kind of optimizing and, and tweaking everything. So when we were hanging out, um, we were talking about that and, this is a, a funny story. So we were talking about travel and I had just gotten back from this trip around the world and I learned some tips. And honestly, I can't remember what they are at the time, but Tim was like, oh, wow, like these are some tips I didn't know. And, you know, Tim is, you know, it's hard to, you know, introduce a new hack for life in any way to Tim. And yeah. he, he was interviewing uh, with the New York Times on an article about travel. And it was about like how the Silicon Valley travel people, you know, do their thing. I can't remember the title. And he was like, oh, let me introduce Chris. And so we went on this article, you know, you can Google this article. It's probably the most embarrassing uh, thing uh, that's ever been in the press about me for, for, for a strange reason, which is this New York Times reporter did a long interview, sent a photographer to the house, probably took dozens of photos of here's the backpack we used. Here's the surge protector we used. Here's all this stuff. And the photo they picked was me and my wife in our backyard holding up a pair of you know, I think they're ex officio moisture wicking underwear. And, and the part of the story was like, you know, we traveled around the world for so long. We brought these like super moisture wicking underwear. My wife and I both had them that you could wash in the shower and wear the next day. So we only needed three or four pairs of underwear for me for seven months. And so the next day I show up at work, it was in the Sunday paper as a half page photo and like seven copies of the New York times around my desk of me and my wife holding up my underwear. Uh, You're the un in, you in become the, un the underwear. Story. The underwear couple. Yeah, so so that's how we kind of got to know each other. Uh, you know, I, you know, we just bounced random ideas off each other over the years, shared things, invested in startups and and whatnot. And so I'd actually reached out to Tim and said, "Hey, you start a podcast. I start a podcast. I've decided I'm going all in. You know a lot. 
And I think one thing I did maybe that not everyone has done with Tim is I went and listened to everything. And I was like, the questions I have for you are not the questions you've answered before. These are like all these new questions. He loves And that. Tim gets Tim gets emails all the time uh, yeah. from podcasters saying, tell me what you learned. I want to start a podcast. And the last time he did anything was in 2017. So he said, you know what? Why don't we record an episode as a follow-up to everything where it's just like, this is the definitive source of everything I've learned about podcasting. That way, anytime someone emails me, which happens almost daily, I'll just say, go listen to this episode. It's good. So we we recorded that episode. I didn't realize that it wasn't going to be, you know, it was like three hours long and I thought we'd edit it down to an hour. No, it was three hours long. Um, And and if you care about podcasting, go listen. Funny enough, I also put it on my feed uh, in my podcast and most of my listeners aren't interested in starting a podcast. It was like one of the worst performing episodes I've ever released because, uh, you know, it was about starting a podcast. It's not as relevant to people as learning about the psychology of money or learning how to, you know, more become indistractable with your day. Like those things were really tangible and those episodes performed amazing. Uh, and then learning how to podcast didn't, but you know, I thought, you know, it was a fun moment to get to interview Tim. And so I wanted to make sure I got a chance to share that with whoever wanted to listen. He's a, he's a, he's a fun guy. My, uh, my, we ran into probably about 15 years ago, we were in Greece and he was dating uh, some chick back then. And my wife became friends with her because uh, they recognized us from, uh, we have a, a YouTube series and um, she became friends with him. And uh, I had just read his book and he called me to wish me a happy birthday uh, for my birthday through, through my wife's friends. And, um, he was a really, really nice guy really was. He loves answering questions that he's never been asked before. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I love that. Um, okay. I'm going to ask you uh, a few things, um, as we wrap here about the personal side of your life, they're going to be the weirdest questions you ever heard. Just roll with them. Um, what's on your nightstand? Right now, uh, some crazy medications because I got shingles and I have these crazy nerve pains and I can't forget to take them. So it's like Adult. water, shingles medicine, uh, Adult chicken pucks. You know, my aura ring, my aura ring charger. And, you know, the one thing that I wish wasn't on my nightstand was my phone, but it, it still is. I haven't broke it's, that habit. It still is. Um, we're all not supposed to check our email and it's the first thing we all do. Yeah. Um, what do people often get wrong about you? Ooh, what do people get wrong about me? Um, I think people think that because I love to save money, I only want, you know, we talked about this. I only want to do cheap things. It's like, oh, this person just wants to, you know, do a walking tour. No, if there's an amazing museum, I want to go to the museum. I want to go do the most amazing experience. And I think, you know, interpreting my love for optimization as being cheap I think is a, an easy thing to do. But if you dig a level deeper, um, you realize that it might have kind of airs of cheapness, but it, it is not, it is not that. And I'm, I'm certainly willing to spend money when necessary. Um, yeah. What are, um, what are some things that you're currently doing that you don't really love? Like, I don't love doing this. Uh, and I, you really would like to do less of it. What, what's one thing that you, you could just, I, I could do less of this. Yeah. I mean, starting a podcast, I didn't realize there were 50 jobs and I'm learning how to take some of those jobs and find other people who are far better at them. And so, you know, I think I started with, it was just me and I was like, okay, well, maybe I want help with putting together some of the social stuff, putting together some of the videos, putting together the editing. I think as a creator, it's hard to let go, but there are things I love about you know, creating and there are things I don't, and I'm learning and and trying to take the things I don't love, um, in, in work, but also in my personal life to try to outsource, outsource and optimize and kind of get rid of, and, you know, just get, you know, anything that I don't love doing. So there's a lot of that in, in, in starting a business. For sure. What's an unusual or absurd thing that you love? It's like, this is weird. People would find this weird, but I love it. This one might take a minute. I'm glad you're going to edit this. <laughs> unusual thing that I love. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, hey, I'm a stamp collector. It may not be that unusual. Or, you know, I love DJing. I love collecting. Go- like, what is a thing that, like, people would look at you and go, I'm actually shocked that he's into that. 
It's a little unusual. It's a little absurd, but he's into it. No, no, no. It's, I get a question. I'm just kind of r- wrapping my head around. Uh, I think I still, you know, if you turn my camera right here, you'll see it. I still, as a child, uh, was a yeah. massive skate nerd. And I yeah. still have a skateboard. I still love going out and riding around. And, uh, you know, I don't know if people would associate me with like a skater punk, but yeah, yeah I still love it. What's one goal that you thought when I get this goal, the whole freaking world is going to be better. My life is going to be better. The, everything is going to be perfect when I get this goal. And then you got it and you're like, didn't change the damn thing. I think everyone thinks that when you land that awesome job, when you reach that financial milestone, and I've, I've, I've been fortunate to hit both of, both of those kind of goals, everything changes and like nothing changes. <laughs> you know, like you're like, okay, on to the next, next, next financial milestone. Oh, here's this thing about this job that's actually way more frustrating than I thought. Um, you know, I thought you were going to go the other way, which is what is the thing that when, it, when you hit it, you're like, wow. Uh, but, you know, for those things, nothing changed. Was there something that you hit that you were like, this is incredible? I think th- th- this probably sounds cliche, but I-, I think that when you find the the person that like totally and fully gets you that you can kind of live the rest of your life with, it really unlocks so many cool things, pushes you to do better, pushes you to push yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my wife and I have been together almost 18 years and like, Every, every day, you know, this morning I was sending out a newsletter. She's like, here's how it could be better. Fix this thing. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we have a great, th- that's a huge boost. And like, you know, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. That's great. Are there any positions or opinions um, either in the last few years or maybe even years ago um, that you changed your mind about? And you're like, you know, I used to think this way, but I, I don't think that way anymore. I, 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 I switched how I think about this. I mean, this wasn't, uh, yeah, here's an interesting one. I, I went through three phases of reading in my life. So as a kid, I loved reading. You know, my parents couldn't pry books away from me. Um, and then somewhere fifth, sixth grade, I was just like, I don't want to read. Not into reading at all. And I don't think I picked a book up, you know, more than like casually one or two times other than like a nonfiction work business book that I needed to read to kind of learn how to do a thing for a long time. And then I started interviewing authors and I started reading their books. And in the last six months, I probably read 25 books. Mm. Um, And I think I thought that for, for probably 20 years of my life, I was like, yeah, the Cliff's notes are fine. You know, the book summary is fine. And then I started actually reading the whole book again, because I really wanted to ask the questions people weren't asking and dig in. And, um, I'm, I'm much more of a fan of reading than I've, you know, maybe not as much as my like two year, you know, second grade self reading, you know, I remember a book called Space Rock that was one of my favorites, but, uh, you know, other than that, that year version of myself, I don't think I've ever kind of been this into reading. And now I have lots of books I'm reading. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, what do people never ask you, but you wish they did? They never, they asked me about milk. They asked me about Grove. They asked me Wellfront. Um, you know, my, but they never asked me this question. What's the thing that they never ask you, but you wish they did. So I love going every, anytime I go to a new place, I love going really deep on the cool stuff to find do for some reason. It just, there, there are people who people interview about travel and all the travel questions are, you know, booking the flight, getting the hotel, but it's never about what to do there. Like, you know, my, my wife and I do, uh, to try to do an escape room in every city we go to. And I feel like I do so much research to try to find the best one and, you know, have the best and no, I've never been like, go do this one in Prague or in Krakow or something. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I, I try to dig into, whether it's a restaurant or an activity. And I feel like that knowledge is just kind of lost, but, you know, I've actually come around to thinking about doing like a 20 minute uh, episode each each week on a new city where me and one other person who's kind of gone deep on a certain city go into all the hacks about that city and traveling to it. So I'm I'm going to force that knowledge out there. That's great. Um, What is the book 
that you have reread or re-listened to the most? So I can't do audiobooks. Uh, I love podcasts, can't do audiobooks. Uh, I don't know why. I think after like 45 minutes, I just fall asleep or something. Yeah. But reread is an interesting one because I don't think I've reread it in the last few years, but there's a book called Vagabonding by Rolf Ro- Potts. Yeah, I had yeah. Rolf on the show. He's great. And I am such a fan of travel and long-term travel and, and what it can do and create that that was the book that I probably read three or four times. It was the book that I probably sent to more people than any other book. Um, and, you know, I think it's just a fantastic book. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people think, oh, well, now I'm a little older. I'm never gonna be able to do this. We're now talking about, could we only have a kid? Could we do this with, with her? Could we do it with her again in the summer when she's in high school? You know, like she's only 15 months. We got a ways to go. But um, I think the kind of art of, of travel beyond just a quick weekend trip or spend a, spend a week here there's, there's something really magical to those experiences. And, you know, that book captures it really well. That's great. Last question. Let's change it up a little bit. What one question would you like to ask me? Yeah, I want to know how I, you know, I, I'm a self-improvement nerd. So what, what could I have done better to either prepare for or to kind of knock this interview out of the park? Oh, man, that's a great question that I'm not going to have a great answer for. Um, now, I give you a different one if you want a yeah. different one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take a different one, but I, but I do want to answer it. Here's I, I'm going to I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the exact opposite answer. No, actually, I'm going to be giving you a good answer because you're going to be able to use it. You're not going to be able to change anything. But here's the answer. You are, in my estimation, remarkably comfortable in your skin and remarkably comfortable with who you are. And that kind of person makes it very easy to ask questions to because you know you're going to get a heartfelt, thoughtful answer. You're not on script. You're not, you don't have an agenda. You're not pushing. You're looking, it's obvious that you're looking to get better. And that kind of person to interview makes you want to go three hours. So don't ever lose that. But, uh, but ask me the next one. Well, the next one's similar. To the extent you listened to any of my show's episodes before this, yeah, how can I improve as a host? I don't. I don't listen to them. I don't read the book or listen to the show because when I do, it puts a lens on me, and I don't want the lens. I do after, but not before because I then start making preconceived notions of like I knew nothing about who you were at all. And I like my my intros to be completely cold because my questions, because what happens is when you start listening to somebody, you take for granted all these things because you're like, oh, I've heard him say it 20 times. And it's not a natural thing that comes across as my first time. Like I would, if I had listened to all of your shows, I would not be digging around the way I was digging around with why you tick the way you do, I would already understand you. And so I wouldn't, I'd be like, I I got him. I I don't need to ask him about that because I got him. So I'm not thinking on my feet. Does that make sense? Yeah. But my follow-up is you knew a lot of anecdotes about selling t-shirts and starting a conference. How did you do the research to learn those things without? I I have a researcher. Okay. I need to be this person. I'll send, I'll send him. I'll send him to you if you want. <laughs> no, I'll send him to you if you want. He's great. Um, shoot me an email. I'll give you his name, and um, he gives me a. Um, uh, I have a a format that I like things done. I'm very uh, chronological. I want I want things from the beginning. I want to know where you started. I want to know where you lived. I want to know what high school you went to, and then I want to know your whole journey, and then I want to know unique and unusual things about you, so that I have. And, and then what I do is I read it and I say, okay, knowing what I know about this person now, what is standing out to me? And the thing with you that, and I started it at the beginning, the thing with you that was standing out to me was like, this motherfucker has been punched in the face so many times and he still, it like, he doesn't stop. And that was the theme. So I was like, I want to know why, 
Like what, like, what is it? That's why I kept getting in there. And I just think that, you know, you probably, it's probably a little bit of both nature and nurture. Your parents were entrepreneurs and, and they raised you well and you, your DNA is that way. So I look in the research for the things that stand out to me, as opposed to getting lost in the, 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 uh, the body of work that you do. And sometimes it's not easy. Like, you know, if I'm interviewing a celebrity, that's not easy because I have a preconceived notion of who they are. Um, but if I don't, I love doing cold interviews. Like I, one, one of my favorite shows, there was a show years ago and this dude worked for CBS Sunday morning. And when they had phone books, he would open up, he'd go into the phone book and he'd open up the white pages and he would go down and randomly pick something and then go knock on their door and interview them. And it was fascinating to me. It was like, come on, this has to be planned. There's no way. And it would like, he narrated it. And then you were in the war and you got a purple heart and then you did, and then she died. And it would be like, what? And it was like this, everybody has a story. So I love whether you're a celebrity or you're nobody. I love piecing the story together, but I like doing it cold. I, I can't do it. I can't get on the interview with you and go, now what's your name? <laughs> Cause that's not going to be a good interview. So I have to have a little, but then when I have a little, like I like to poke around. I like it. I, I do not. I have a complete opposite and different process that I'm open to evolving. And, and this was really helpful. So thank you. Yeah, you got it, man. Shoot me an email and I'll send you his info. Perfect. Any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? Yeah, I mean, if 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 you want to learn a little bit more about how everything I do works, you know, you're listening to a podcast now, go check out All The Hacks, search for it, allthehacks.com, reach out. I'm just Chris at allthehacks.com. Would love to hear from you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. 